Hello and welcome, distinguished friends and partners of Melbourne Connect. I'm delighted to welcome you to this, the inaugural Melbourne Connect duration, a centrepiece of the Melbourne Connect Innovation Week Festival. My name is Georgia Von Guttner and I'm the Director of Innovation Precincts here at the University of Melbourne and I'm your MC for this evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to any First Nations people here with us tonight. Tonight's oration topic is the promises and threats of AI for society and business and will be delivered by eminent computer scientist and the Executive Director of Melbourne Connect, Professor Edouard Hovey. To follow, Steve Morris, Group Owner of Data Intelligence Business at Telstra, will provide a response to the oration. We'll then invite your questions through a Q&A session. As advertised, this event is being live streamed. I would like to thank the sponsors of the Melbourne Connect Innovation Week Telstra and welcome any Telstra colleagues in the audience. To introduce our speaker is Professor Nicola Phillips. Professor Phillips is the Acting Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne and Provost, which means she leads the leading and teaching activities of the university. Nicola is a Professor of Political Economy and in recent years her research has centred on production and global value chains, global migration and labour standards and exploitations. Please welcome Professor Nicola Phillips. Thank you, Georgia, very much, and good evening to all of you. Um, I also acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose lands we're meeting this evening. It is my very great pleasure and honour to be here with you tonight for the inaugural Melbourne Connect oration. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you, students, staff, our many industry partners, members of the public. Thank you for making the effort to come this evening. Uh, we're really very pleased to see you. I'd particularly like to acknowledge our colleagues from Telstra who are partnering with us to deliver this event. And I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit later from Mr. Steve Morris, who was introduced to you just now as the group owner of Data Intelligence Business at Telstra. So um, I think it's my job to be very brief so that we can get to our main event this evening. We will hear about the promises and threats of AI for society and business. It's a fascinating topic that speaks to the heart of what Melbourne Connect is all about, drawing together researchers, industry, government, and entrepreneurs to work on the challenges of tomorrow. Our most pressing challenges, including our changing climate, improving health and well-being, designing the future of work, and working in a world of artificial intelligence, cannot be faced by academics, by business people, or by government officials alone. It's incumbent on all of us to work across sector lines in a spirit of collaboration and curiosity and open-mindedness to foster our innovation ecosystem and to create opportunities and solutions that improve our society today and tomorrow. So as we listen to our speaker tonight, I encourage all of us to consider our role in strengthening this innovation ecosystem. What action can we take today and tomorrow to foster the innovation community that we need to see to address these challenges. It is my very great privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, our orator uh, for this evening, Professor Edward Hovey. Um, he has a distinguished career, as all of you will know, in working across academia, industry and government to drive our understanding of artificial intelligence and to bring digital innovation projects to fruition. He is the Executive Director of Melbourne Connect and Professor of Digital Innovation at the School of Computing and Information Systems, which sits within our Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology. Professor Hovey is known to all of us as an eminent computer scientist and one of the original 17 fellows of the Association for Computational Linguistics. He is the author of over 400 peer-reviewed journal articles, techni technical articles, and advises students, projects, and research efforts right across the world. 
He holds a PhD in computer science from Yale University and has been awarded honorary doctorates in Spain and the Netherlands. He was a research professor in the Language Technologies Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and prior to joining us about six months ago at the University of Melbourne was program manager of the Information Innovation Office at the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, better known to all of us as DARPA, uh, with the responsibility to develop, execute and transition programs in artificial intelligence, natural language processing, planning and machine learning. So there really is no better person to speak with us this evening and to deliver the inaugural Melbourne Connect oration about the exciting promise of AI and some of the risks that we need to be mindful of as we pursue our research and innovation objectives. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Professor Ed Hovey. Good evening, dear Provost Nicola and dear DBCR Jim, other dignitaries here present, everybody else, friends, Telstra, thank you for coming. It's a little sort of intimidating standing here with the first, you know, oration from Melbourne Connect, but it's a chance to tell you a little bit about what AI is. Because it's something I've worked on all my research career, more than 35 years, and something I feel passionate about. I started with AI because I thought it's an interesting thing. It's a way of understanding what happens in your mind, right? And not just sort of a theory, but something you can build a computer program to test. So it's sort of an empirically testable theory in some sense. And through the decades, it's become... I don't know, it's become happy and daunting to see the success of AI from the early dream to now the present time, to the fearful time that we're going into. And that's what I'd like to talk about here, okay? Now, I don't want to give a sort of a technical lecture with mathematics and formulas and things because that's not the point of the evening. But I would like to give you a sense of how AI, how this magical AI works. It's an intuitive sense, because that's something that if you can walk away with that understanding, you're armed, you're ready to speak to the challenges, to at least think about the challenges that we will all face in the next few years and the next decade and the next few decades, as long as we live. Soon, we will not drive anymore, right? Because there'll be self-driving cars. Soon, a lot of the jobs we have will begin to vanish. All kinds of things are going to happen. Every advanced technology has killed people. AI will be no different. What are we going to do about it? Only if you have a sense of how AI works, sort of an intuitive sense, will you be able to say, this is hype, this is nonsense, this is real, this I better pay attention to, right? My job tonight, what I would like to do is give you a sense of just how that works, just a, an intuitive sense, okay? So let's begin with something very, very simple. Okay, well, let's, let's, do, let's stay on this for a moment. How many words do you know? Any guesses? Five? Pardon? 5,000. 10,000. Any more? Can we go higher? <laughs> How many words do you know? Presumably you've spoken English, let's just say English, for most of your life. How many words do you know? You don't know how many words you know. Well, take a dictionary tonight, a big one, and open it at random and sort of see what percentage of the words you know <clears throat> and open it again and see and work out that for, and then look in the front that says, I have there's so many words in this dictionary. You'll discover you know, as an educated native English speaker, <clears throat> you know around 90,000 to 100,000 words. Not names, words, right? Not word forms, not like sing and sang, but just the root, okay? you know about 90,000 to 100,000 words as an educated English speaker. Now, when did you learn these words? When you were born, you knew no words, right? When you were about 21, which is about 7,000 days later, you knew, let's say, 70,000 words. That is to say, on average, you learned 10 new words per day. You learned 10 new words per day. Did you know that? Were you aware of that? 
Think what I'm saying. Every day of your life, when you were a small toddler all the way up to 21, you were learning 10 new words. The numbers don't lie. You know 90,000 or 70,000 at the age of 21. You knew zero at the age of zero. You learned 10 words a day. How did that happen? You didn't know that you were learning these words. Now, there's all kinds of fascinating stories I can tell you about this, but the point of my little exercise here is to say, AI works in a sort of a magical way. It works in a hidden way that you're not aware of, but its effects are startling. When you start doing AI research, when you start developing AI, you look at a startling effect, something that looks like intelligence, which we don't know how to define, by the way, and you try to understand how you can decompose it and how you can break it down to simple things, how you can measure pieces until you come to the point where you say, oh, that's actually not so hard. And then you, you, you build little pieces of computer programs to do those little pieces. And then, voila, somehow, by magic, the thing comes together. And if you're lucky, you have a self-driving car. You have something that goes to the moon and plans its own operation. You have a robot that can help with fabricate f uh, factories and things, or can drive a drone or something. No? How do you do this? How do you make this work? That's the whole point. AI started in 1956, just after the Second World War, when there was a conference in New Hampshire at Dartmouth College, about 10 people came, and they sat together and they, they identified six or eight areas, language translation, planning, reasoning, as the big AI sort of challenges. And they said, in 10 years' time, computers should be able to do most of this, and then we'll be fine. Well, we are 70 years after that, and we still are only beginning to do this, but we are now beginning to do this. You cannot open a newspaper or a, a listen to a television um, report or something today without somewhere hearing AI or the echoes of AI. It's coming and it's coming fast, mostly because of neural networks in the last decade. So I want to tell you a little bit about simple AI, magical AI, how neural networks do this magical AI, and what that means for us as a society, and how we should respond to it from research side and from corporate side, okay? So I'd like to show you here just a list of what, what you can call straightforward AI and magical AI. And straightforward AI is the kind of AI you can imagine, well, <clears throat> let's say how you write a chess program. Well, you take the chess board, you, you define a little function that gives a score to the board saying, well, if I'm on this position, I get so many points. If this little piece is here, it gets so many points. If this little piece is protected by that little thing, it gets more points. If the king is being attacked, it gets less points, fewer points, etc., etc. So for any possible configuration on the board, you can assign a score. So now you say, I'm here in my game. If I do this move, I'll get that score. If I do that move instead, I'll get a different score. If I do this move, so you build what's called a decision tree. Now, if I do move number one, which is gonna put me in the best position, my opponent is going to, then I can look at all the moves that person can make, and I could say, well, they're going to maximize their score. In that case, I need to see how I will maximize my score in response to their response to my initial move, right? So you get what you call a mini-max pruning algorithm through a big decision tree, and suddenly you say, that's not so difficult. I have to do a lot of bookkeeping. I have to keep all my scores right and things. But basically, I can sort of imagine how to do that, okay? Everything on my list on the left side is kind of non-magical AI. It's AI you, can, you have to do a lot of work. It's spe you spend several PhD theses or decades to do it, but you can do it, right? Okay. The other side, you come to things that you can think of as sort of magical AI. And a big one has always been systems that can read by themselves and teach themselves and answer questions by themselves. If you had that, and people have been promising since the early 90s to do that, there's a famous project called Psych to do this, if you had that, you could build a system that could outlearn any child you have. It could outlearn us. It's not there yet. Is it coming? And if it did so, would we have this super intelligent being that knows more than anything we would know? Now, you might say we already have that. It's called the web. You say, really? The web? It's 50% pornography. It's a whole lot of rubbish, right? Do you really want that? As is, if an alien comes and they say, this, this is the product of human ingenuity. Oh my God, they're gone, right? They're gone tomorrow, right? 
So you want something more sensible, but what is it that you want? How do you want to build an AI system that sucks that information in and organizes it and can respond intelligently, whatever that might be? Okay, now for each of the things on the right, there is sort of a magical component. I'd like to take a moment to describe to you one example, because I can't go through all of this. I'm going to take, because it's my field, language, technology, semantics, linguistics, computation. I'm going to take question answering, and I'm going to walk you step by step through how you do it in a very simple way. And please bear with me. If you get bored, just say, I'm bored, and I move on fast, OK? All right? And then I'm going to go, when, I, when you sort of see how it works, then I'm going to go to the magical step of neural networks and how they do question answering and how little we understand today, even though they outperform our non-magical techniques. And then I want to go from that into the image. You've all heard about DALI and you've heard about this thing that does image generation and make image painting and things. I want to show you a little bit about that and why that works based on, on the question answering thing. And then we go to the end. Is that okay? Yes? All right. Good, let's, let's start. Now, AI has dangers, right? Every technology has killed somebody, all of them, right? As I mentioned before, and so AI is not different. The point of this, please remember, is so that you can understand something about how AI works and what you can do, what you can do against it or for it or to ring fence it or something, right? That's the point of this, right? It's not just an exercise in how does QA work. Okay, so there's the four parts. Right, we finished the introduction part. Now let's look at this non-magical question answering capability, how it works, because it's part of learning by reading, automatic knowledge acquisition. And then let's move into the magical part, the neural network part, and then how that, what that means for us. In 2003, <clears throat> I led a little project to try to see, can we use the web as our encyclopedia? The, the art of question answering Automatic question answering was very new then. So we built this system and we tested it. And so we had questions like, where, <laughs> you can see there, right? Where do lobsters like to live? And it said, on the table. <laughs> now, you can see why it said that, right? It's stupid, but it's not wrong. It's not crazy, right? You can see the logic. Huh? Another one here. Where are zebras most likely found in the dictionary? It is true that every dictionary of English you have, you will find the word zebra. You will find it there. Literally, it's correct. But it's not what I meant when I asked the question. What went wrong? What is it in your head that understands what I meant when I asked the question that it didn't know? You see what I'm saying? There's something more you communicate than when you just say the words. Another one there. How many people live in Chile? Nine, well, at least nine live in Chile. It's correct, there are nine people in Chile. It's just, we know there's more, right? Where did this come from? There was some airplane accident and nine people died. It found it, said, there's nine people in Chile. Yeah, it's even, right? And my favorite one, what is an invertebrate? Dukakis. <laughs> Dukakis was a presidential candidate in the US, 1988, right? And somebody called him spineless. You see the logic, right? <laughs> So, okay, he was, they asked him an, a very ugly question. They asked him on television because there was a case of Willie Horton who had murdered somebody. And they said, well, if somebody like Willie Horton murdered your wife, would you go for the death penalty to, to, to you know, kill this murderer? And he said, no. And they said, you're spineless. And the Republicans painted him and he lost the election, right, completely, right? You can see why this machine thought he's spineless because you can see the logic of these words, right? And so you say, well, it's doing some reasoning. It's not crazy. That's why we laugh. We can see, we put the logic together and we see the humor in there, but it's wrong. You now have to understand, A, how to make it in the first place. B, how, because it's wrong, how you find out where it goes wrong and what you do about that. And C, once you do that, how you put it all together to not go wrong in the future. That turns out to be quite difficult. Right? We still don't have good QA systems, but the neural network things are getting much better. I'll show you in a second. Let's see how this works. I give you a question. When was Mozart born? And the answer is 1756. Okay. Now, how would you do it? If you had to write a computer program, you'd say, well, where is it? It's on the web somewhere in Wikipedia, maybe. Huh? So I go and I look at Wikipedia and I type in Mozart born when something, and I get things like this. 
And I look there and I say, hmm, if I can find these little snippets and I can do the right um, sort of matching of pieces, I can pull out 1756. It's there, right? I just have to know how to find the snippets and pull out the right thing. So I write myself a little bunch of patterns, basically. And there I've got two sets of patterns. One is the Bourne pattern and one is the Y famous pattern. If I say, who was Nelson, Man Nelson Mandela? I don't want to know he was Nelson Mandela. I know he was Nelson Mandela. I want to know who is Nelson Mandela. If I say, who's the mayor of Melbourne? Then I want the name. But if I say, who's Nelson Mandela? I want, basically, I'm asking why famous, right? So I need patterns like the why famous pattern. So I have to sit down for every question type and there's a few hundred question types, I have to sit down and actually build my little patterns, which we did by hand in those days. And we build this big typology, this taxonomy of question answer pattern types to match the question type and get the corresponding answer type with the corresponding answer pieces and their semantic types, like a date or an achievement or something, and then do the matching, okay? And then we say, okay, <clears throat> this is how you do it. You get the question, and then you build the query, you go to Google or somewhere, and you bring all your, your preferred document set, and you bring back the documents that you want, right? And then you go and find the little snippets, and you apply these little patterns, and you sort of match, 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 and you do the semantic type matching. You say, I'm looking for a date, I'm looking for a date. Ah, this thing smells like a date, this thing smells like a date. You put all the dates together, you get them all, you aggregate over 50 or 80 examples, and then you say, well, my most popular date seems to be 1756. That's what I'm going to do, right? And so when you do this, you usually start with, let's say, a million documents that come back, and you get a few thousand of these little sentences, and you get 50 or so snippets, and you get five candidate answers, and you rank them by popularity or by likelihood or something like this, and you give the answers back, and you win. And then when you go to the web as opposed to corpus, you can generally add 10% or now more, right? Now, that's not magic. Right? Once you see how it's done and you have this idea of patterns and semantic types, you say, oh, I could have done that had I known and had I taken the time. Basically, it's not magic, right? It's a few PhD theses in here, but it's not magic anymore. Okay. Now, it turns out you can do a lot with patterns. Did you know that you're an expert on the Panama Canal? I bet you you didn't know, but please read my beautiful text there and please answer my questions. Can you answer the questions? Of course you can answer the questions, because you know the semantic types of what you're looking for. And if that's all you can recognize in here, it doesn't matter what the English says or the Spanish or the French, right? So you can actually go a long way once you know a little bit about these semantics, these meanings of these types, and you have a little bit of pattern engineering. You can go and give a lot of good techniques. You can go and pull a lot of information out of the web and put them in your favorite database, spreadsheet, whatever, and you could say, my machine is learning. It's learning. It's learning facts. In fact, it'll soon know more than my eight-year-old, and then more than my 16-year-old, and maybe more than me. The simple way. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that surprising? Well, guess who did that? IBM. I know that team. I was on their advisory board. Uh, Dave Ferrucci and Chris Welty and others, they sat down and they said, we can do this. And they took all their programmers and they put them in two rooms with big long trestle tables and they said, hammer it, guys. And they hammered it. And they built 101 types. There was the Y famous type. There was the when born type. There was the rhyming type. There was all the crazy types based on the kinds of questions that you get in this Jeopardy game. I don't know if you ever ha had a chance to see the game, but it was interesting to watch. This is a real television show with people who stand up there and answer questions and race one another to, to, to get, you know, who, who gets to answer first. And you win sometimes. The guy on the left there, his name is Ken Jennings. He was the best. He won tens of millions of dollars in this game. The guy on the right was the second best scorer. And the thing in the middle was the system Watson, which you've no doubt heard of, right? And the system Watson, they built with computers that were locked, cut off from the internet, they had all the storage in there. Sony, who owns the game, Sony Corporation, they made very strict rules about how you're gonna have this game to make sure it's a real competition between human and machine. And the machine won. The machine won. Now, it was lucky, if you look at this little graph, which I got from them, and you look on the bottom axis, the x-axis, that says just, what's the confidence that you are 
that you have the answer correct, right? How sure is the system that it's correct? Because it's got a lot of different evidence, and if all the evidence points to one place, it's pretty confident and stuff. And on the y-axis is how correct is it? Is it actually right? So if you look at this bottom little brown line, when they started building the system, it was pretty crappy. <laughs> its score is low, no? And it didn't have much of an idea of confidence. But as it went up month by month, three months by three months, they just put in more patterns. It was a pattern-based system. They wrote patterns like crazy, these people, and they put them in, and, and, or, and you can see the lines go up. That means it's more and more and more correct. And you also see on the right-hand side, it's more and more correct. So it, it's more and more confident of the answers it gives. Now, the way it was written is if it's not confident enough, it spends a little more time, another few seconds thinking and getting more evidence. But of course, the human is going to press the button, right? So it's got a trade-off, and they had two mathematicians working on the trade-off. When do I press the button? Based on my estimate of the difficulty of the question, my estimate of how likely that my contestants are going to press their buttons versus how sure am I? That's a lot of mathematics in there. It was two mathematicians working on this for two years. Just that little piece, right? So it's not a simple thing to do, but it's conceptually, now that you understand how patterns work, not difficult to understand either, right? Right? Okay. So at the top there, you see the top bar, and you see those little light blue dots. Those are the dots of all the games that Ken Jennings played. And you can see, in general, Ken Jennings is better than this system. They were very lucky to win that night. What happened was there's some boxes where you get double score and Ken had the chance and he chose the wrong box. He thought the double score was there and when it wasn't the double score, you can see on his face, he's like, oh my God, I lost this thing because I don't get the double points. And so, and as soon as he gave his answer, which was correct on that one, the machine chose the other candidate box for double score. It was double score, it was right and it beat him. And they never, ever played the game on television again. No, of course not, because they would lose against Ken, right? They would have to play about 75 games to get a statistically valid average for the, the, the level of, the, of this thing. And you can see it's not as good as Ken Jennings. However, they did win that one. And they stuck with this. They won a lot of money. They made a lot of money for IBM. IBM was selling its Watson system for a million dollars a shot with no knowledge in. And then once you bought this, you discover the thing's empty and you go back to and they say, well, it's going to cost you another million dollars to populate it. Right? So they get their $2 million. They gave um, Ferrucci and Chris Welty $50,000 each as a prize. Guess where those two guys are working? One has got his own company and the other one went off to Google. Neither of them is with IBM anymore. Okay. You've got to look after your researchers when they do something nice for you. And we take that to heart too. All right. Now, this is what their slide is of what it looks like. And I'm not going to go along with this, but there's a lot of boxes. And what you see is when the question comes in, the thing sort of propagates, it propagates question variations, types of things, candidates, snippets, answers, and comes up to thousands of that, and then it filters them down and gives you its ranking of the answers. That's sort of the feeling. So there's a lot of pieces in here. Not an easy thing to build, but conceptually not that hard to understand. Okay? All right? You're with me, right? Okay. Now let's move to the magic. <clears throat> About 10, 12 years ago, neural networks entered the public discourse. They had been worked on for since the 1970s. A neural network is a slightly different way of computing. The traditional computing is you've got something, a little program, a piece of code, some, some instructions, a recipe, and somebody gives you some input and you, you activate this program and it looks at the input and it does what you told it to do and it gives you the answer. Now imagine you say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to take a tiny little thing that takes some, some piece of in some abstracted input and does some numerical computation and gives some abstracted output. You say, well, that's a waste of time. Why do you care? And you say, well, if I take a lot of these little things and I wire them together correctly, then I can take the same input you gave me before, but I can re-represent it as an abstract set of numbers and I can push it through this thing. And if I can train this thing to do the same transformation as you used to do in your traditional recipe, maybe I can do better. <coughs> There was, there was about three or four people who believed religiously that this was the right thing to do and they would win. And they tried in the 70s and AI basically laughed at them. 
they had a thing called a perceptron, and they, they, they had, I think uh, there's pictures there, there's sort of a simple input-output thing. It's sort of reminiscent of neurons in the brain. It's not exactly the same, but there's some, some similarities in just what it looks like. And that thing for 30 or 25 years was just most AI people considered a waste of time. There were these people in MIT and, and San Diego and various uh, CMU who worked on this, and everybody says, ah, these are the crazies. But then computation went big. You could get big, big, big machines. And there was the data on the web. Lots, lots, lots of data. And these guys got clever. They put together not just the perceptron, but a whole bunch of perceptron. It was called a recurrent neural net, which is a whole series of them wired together. And then on the left bottom, <coughs> one of the most common current powerful things called a transformer, where it's just a small picture. You can have like 125 and another 125 and another. You can have a whole bunch of layers and cross connections. And now, now when you start putting a lot of data through that thing and you've got some magical where the little sigma is, a lot summation function, you have a different a nonlinear function, it's called a tan h function or something. Suddenly, just suddenly, the magic happens. What happens is you've got your your words, which you feed in, and instead of the English symbol, the word, you make a little vector, let's say, 100 positions, and you just put numbers in, a random number. You don't care what number. You just give it some numbers in there. Every word, every of your 90,000 words or 200,000 words, you give just random numbers, and then you take a whole bunch of text, <clears throat> and you say to this machine, you know, I'm giving you a sentence. I'm focusing on this word Mozart. I'm going to blank out this word Mozart, I want you to predict back this mo word Mozart. It's called a, 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 it's an autoencoder. It's encoding its own representation. So it looks at all these words and says, you know, every time you give me Mozart, I'm seeing things like compose and Vienna and Salzburg and 1756 and opera and music. All those words have their little numbers, but somehow when I see a sort of a pattern of numbers, those numbers must point me back to the Mozart pattern. Now, I don't know how to describe it better, I'm sorry. I just can't describe it in English better. But what happens is when you feed 100,000 or 200,000 or a million examples of sentences with Mozart through this thing, and it guesses wrong the first time, and you say, hmm, Mm, that's wrong, okay? But when it guesses right, you say, oh, that's right. When it guesses wrong, you take the numbers and you push them back down. It's called back propagation. And in each little circle there, there's a little function, a little formula, and you make it go higher and lower. And on each little line, there's a little number that says, oh, this is a good one. You can, you you can take this who helped me when I was right. It was big when I was right. I'm going to make you, I'm going to reward you. You're going to get a bigger number. You can push more information. You, you helped me, you little line or you little circle, and you helped me get the wrong answer, I'm going to depress you. So you're, you're retraining these, this network with higher and lower numbers based on what you wanted to have. That's called a training, reinforcement learning, right? And so you reinforce this thing until ultimately the numbers inside the vectors there, they change, and Mozart has its own personality of numbers and Born has its own personality of numbers, and 1756 has its own personality of numbers, etc. Nobody understands exactly how it works, and every time you retrain it and start it, you get different sets of numbers. However, however, this thing has a magical ability now to recombine the numbers and give you behavior that you never thought you could get. And when these guys, these religious fervor people started doing this, I, I <coughs> went through a bit of a crisis a bit of an identity crisis, I think, oh shit, we didn't think this stuff is going to work, and it's working. What do we do now? And you had basically two reactions. You had the reactionaries who said, this is just nonsense, and there's no science here, it's just luck. And the other people said, I'm not going to get a job. I have to understand this. And all the students, I can tell you, all of them ran off and started doing this. All the companies are doing this. Google and others are putting a lot, a lot of money in building big, big machines, getting big amounts of data to do all kinds of crazy things with this general paradigm. As long as you can figure out what to train, what function to put in the circles, how to do the back propagation, how to put the starting numbers, how to put your corpus together, you can train almost anything. It is amazing what you can do. Now, when you look inside the little vectors, you say, well, okay, I'm just going to understand what the thing learns. This is what you see. Here is some words, good, not good, bad, etc. 
And those little lines, those little colored lines, they give you the pieces of the vector and each color corresponds to some number. Is it a low number or a high number between zero and one? So you look and you think, well, good, not good, bad, they should have similar kind of number pattern, shouldn't they? Because they're different from Mozart and they're different from 1756 and 1982. Those dates should have a similar pattern and stuff. I invite you, I invite you to find the, say, the little number patterns. I thought about 10 years ago that I would find the not operator pattern, that I could take white and put the not pattern and multiply them together and get black and take happy and take that same not pattern and multiply it together and get sad and short and tall. And I had a student working on this, one of my good students, for about nine months. She couldn't find anything. There isn't a knot pattern. I don't know how this works, and I don't think anybody knows exactly how this works. All we know is you do some kind of decomposition, and you get some kind of patterns based on the task that you have, and you get these patterns, and they reflect somehow what's inside these words and how they combine with one another. That's the best I can do to describe to you. Okay? I'm sorry. So please don't switch off, because it's not bad news in some sense. Here is sort of a picture of word clusters. When you start throwing, you say, I don't care about the patterns, but I'm going to look at how the words cluster in some representation space, we call it. And you can't see this, so don't worry. Take my word for it. These words cluster together. You have the, the, the colors, and you have the dates, and you have this. They do when these representations come out, and you put them into two-dimensional representation spaces like this, or three-dimensional boxes. You can actually find clusters. Now, now we get to the actual magic and then I'll stop with the heavy stuff. It's okay, all right? So please don't go sleep yet. This is kind of important to listen to, right? Now we come to what they call large language models. If you take a neural network like this and you say, well, I'm, I've got my little training data. I want to do something. But, say the eager, hungry, arrogant people in Google and OpenMind, Elon Musk's company, OpenAI and other places like that, they say, I'm going to read most of the web, and I'm going to put all this knowledge in the web, minus maybe the pornography, into my, 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 my machine, right? So it's going to have its numbers having all the sentences in the web in there, and I'm going to train it by just taking sentences and pulling out one word and saying, predict me this word, please, and it's going to look at all the stuff, and when it predicts the right one, I'm going to reward that configuration of numbers. If it predicts the wrong one, I'm going to punish them through the back propagation, up and down and up and down, and it's going to take me nine months, a year, two years, on big machines, taking a lot of energy. I heard somebody say today who knows about this thing, to train one of these large language models takes as much electricity as an average Australian house uses in 40 years. And I believe that number, right? There's a big ecological footprint on what these things are doing. But, but when they build these large language models, they have essentially an a representation, an encoding of the world's knowledge in there. Now, we can't read it as humans. I'll show you sort of what it looks like. But you can ask questions, and it gives you better answers than any other system, any non-magical system we can devise. And we don't know how the damn thing works. That's the frustration. We don't really know how it works. But we use it all the time. This is the big problem for society today. AI people can build phenomenal things using this technology, but they don't know really how it works. And when it makes a mistake, it thinks it's good. It has no notion of when it's not good. And we don't know how to diagnose when it's good or not. So we're struggling here with a problem, which is what I want to get to at the end. So imagine we have this neural network. Let's see a bit how it works, right? We have all these little nodes. And we start putting in sentences about Mozart. So we go to the web. And we just pull out a whole bunch of sentences. We throw them in there. This is the best slide I could make just to show the confusion. It's in there somewhere, okay? Trust me, okay? Now I give a question. And the question gets eaten up by the system and goes into the same place. Now, its Mozart word is decomposed in its little vector and it spreads all over this network. And its born word spreads somewhere else. Its other word spreads somewhere else. And these words congeal into wherever in the higher level sort of Mozartish information and the Bornish information and the Wenish information, they all congeal. And because they are strong, because I put the question in, this is the thing I'm now pushing actively, when they come together in their pattern, the thing that typically associates with Mozartish and Wenish and Bornish is 1756. It's just the thing that many, many training 
examples in the corpus, it's read two thirds of the web, happen to go together. And so it gives me the answer, 1756. And because it's all this decomposition and recomposition through very large computation, through lots and lots of data, it does better at this de- and recomposition than any system we can devise. And it has something to do with the fact that it's breaking them down in very small little vectors of numbers that we as humans can't do. It's deeper sort of sub subatomic in some sense, right? Quark level. We can't understand what they are, but what they are is when they recombine through this regime, they come back with the right numbers. Okay. So let's look at an example now. Has anyone heard of DALI? Right? This is this famous new thing that makes pictures, right? At the top, you give it words. It's written, it was made by, by Elon Musk's company recently, right? So you give it words like Napoleon as a cat with cheese, and you watch, and it draws you a picture. And you give it words again, and it watch, draws you another picture. It just keeps going. That's not a bad picture. The second picture up there is a prize, is a prize-winning piece of art that the system made. And last week, in some art competition, it actually won the prize, right? And the bottom one there, it shows how it took Vermeer's painting and do this, and, you, and, and how it can take Charles Darwin and show you different perspectives. It does amazing things. Now, how does it work? It starts with a backdrop of just random pixels. You give it a word, right? Like baboon or raccoon or something like this. It goes through its distributed memory and says, well, what is an image? Because you don't only have to give it words, you can give it pictures. What does a raccoonish image look like? There's a nose-ish piece, and there's a tail-ish piece, and there's a fur-ish piece, and there's a whatever it is, and it's all scattered. Let me see, because they're all sort of pixel maps, which of these pixel maps matches best to what I have? Ah, oh, here is a match. Let me just reinforce these and weaken the other ones. Well, you've reinforced some, it says, oh, now I can reinforce others. You go round and round and round, and you watch magically as this thing comes and reinforces itself into that picture. And when you run it again, it starts with a different random pattern. It gives you a different picture. That's how it works, right? So here's a little one and a half minute clip on exactly how this works, right? So there you take the Vermeer, the famous Vermeer girl with a pearl earring, and you go and say, well, okay, what must I do? I want to take this picture now, and I want to do something with it. I, I, I go and I choose the size of my brush. This is literally step by step how you can use the software. I'm going to say, I'm going to paint that blue part out. I want the system to do something new from its own invention, that, that blue part. And so I'm going to tell it what I want. I want red, roses, hat. So it goes and said reddish, roses-ish, hat-ish, in this context, on this, and it finds its stuff and matches it in and puts it there. Now you go to Monet and you say the same with a hat and it makes different hats, many different hats. Now you say, well, okay, I don't want to just make her hat. I want to do around the context. Please imagine for me where she was sitting. So I paint around the context and I say, fill that space in. And it just says, well, I know what it looks like here. I'm going to do sort of matching of my patterns of images that fit that context. And I'm just going to keep going. And so it starts making more and more different contexts for you. And they look right because they match the initial given contexts, right? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that astounding what this thing does? You can do the same here with this famous, you know, farmers, this picture by, I forget who it was. And so you choose there and just one more second and we can go on. So I want to show just how it chooses the right, you give the context. See, now it chooses backgrounds which are completely different from the Monet backgrounds, but contextually completely okay, right? So neural networks are too easy and too good. Any graduate student can use them. I applied to use DALI yesterday. They gave me permission this morning. I can set it up. I can use it on my laptop anytime. I just, I link into the thing they go, right? Anybody who understands a little bit of programming can do this. So you can go and win art competitions, these things. Imagine what you could now do with fake Right? You can start painting pictures on top of other pictures and people's faces you can change, etc. You can start doing dangerous things, maybe. Right? Now, they fool us. <clears throat> and now I have a choice point here. I can go and tell you a little bit more about how they fool us and what we can do to not fool, or I can just basically stop, or I can wind up quickly. So it's up to you to say, you know, how, what, what would you like? If I run through quickly, um, it'll take another 15 minutes. 
if I stop soon, I just run through a bunch of slides and then I'll take another five minutes. So do you have energy for another 15 minutes? Or Steve, what do you think? No? It's OK? Yes? All right. So let's do it quickly. Then. OK. I want to show you three examples, sort of fun examples of what happens. <clears throat> the machines are not as good as we think they are, and we get fooled. Here is a piece of text that is a typical kind of thing that is given in the language community to test machine reading. So here's the piece of text in the, the, in the black pieces there, the, the bold face are possible answers to the question. Here's the question that you give the system. It's a neural network trained system. Here's the possible candidate answers. And what does it do? It picks the right answer as you would, having read the question. OK, so you say, OK, it knows patterns. It's done, it's read something. One of my students in a prize winning paper took that passage and replaced it by rubbish words. No English there, no? And you ask the same question, and guess what happens? It did the same thing. It gets the right answer. It gets the right answer, even though there's no passage to read. Why? Because when you look at the question, there's a bunch of these political words, politician words. If you look at the four candidate answers there, you see that some of them are politicians, one of them is a, a freight company, one of them is just nobody in the internet and things. And so it just happened to say, well, you're giving me these candidates, I'm looking at your question, I'm not reading, I'm just matching, I'm short-circuiting the whole operation. Now many, many AI papers and researchers don't bother to check that they're being short-circuited. And they make all kinds of outlandish claims and the press picks us up and we read this and we become afraid. Don't be afraid, be a little hard-nosed and say, excuse me, have you done your homework? Okay, that's an important thing. Let's look at GPT-3, which is a very famous big program language model. People claimed in a paper two years ago that it can do addition. It can add numbers. It's never been taught to add numbers. It just read a lot of the web. If you look at this graph there, the, the bottom axis shows you how much of the web it has read. 175 billion parameters means a big proportion of the English web has gone through this machine. All of Wikipedia, all kinds of things, right? a lot. That's a lot of words in 175 billion, right? It takes a long time to train this thing. You look at the y-axis and it shows you how correct this thing is. If you look at number one there, or number two, it shows you two-digit two addition, just saying 15 and 15, it can do. Three-digit additions, 127 plus 499 plus 372, it can do, but not as well. If you look at number four, four-digit additions, it cannot do this nearly as well. If you look at number five, you say, excuse me, GPT-3 enthusiasts, why is your machine able to add when it's two numbers, just two digits and two digits, son, but not when it's four and four. If I give it to my eight-year-olds, they can do, if they can do two digits, they can do four digits and five digits. Why can your machine not do this? Well, what's happening is it's got tables like this on the internet. It read them. It memorized them. It didn't know the logic of addition. It just memorized things. So what I did, <clears throat> I did this little perverse little test there. I said, okay, GPT-3, here I'm going to define a new operator called plus plus. Right? And so 2 plus plus, does it, does it show the plus plus here? Yes. yes, OK. So I'm defining 2 plus plus 1 as 2 plus 1 and another one, right? And that's 4. I'm defining that new to you. So GPT-3 has never seen this thing. And I gave this to my 8-year-olds, my 7-year-olds then. And I say, please do the sum. I gave them exactly there, that, what you see there. And they, they looked and they said, minus, minus. Well, it probably means subtract twice the second thing. They fill in. They got it correct. GPT-3 died all over the place. It had no idea what to do, right? Because it hadn't been trained. So this is the second question. Make sure your researchers who are claiming things have done their homework and tested the edge cases and things. And the same thing, make sure that they understand, that, that, that they know exactly what's the parameters of what this thing has been trained to do and what's outside, and that they don't stray and make claims outside of what it's, allowed to, what it's been trained to do, because then they get into this trouble. Right. Story generation. <clears throat> Here's another thing by GPT-2's predecessor. There was a big hype when it was announced 
where people said, this thing can generate English. You give it a little paragraph, and then it just happily generates a story for you. And, they said, it's too dangerous to give to the public, they said, because the public will go and do all kinds of myths and disinformation, all kinds of things like this, and generate all kinds of things people would believe, they said. So here's a paragraph of what it actually generated in response. I don't have time to read all through this thing, but when you start asking specific questions about the, the <clears throat> what's inside this paragraph, how does sentence one conform to sentence four, conform to sentence seven, you discover there's no logic. This thing doesn't know what it's talking about. It's just spinning out sentences and then looks at the previous part of the previous sentence and it applies some patterns and continues and continues. It just happily goes crazy. It's not doing anything that anybody would take seriously. Certainly, Mr. Putin and his friends, he's up in Leningrad who are busy building this, this misinformation institute there for us, they don't use this, I can tell you. No human being would be fooled by this thing. <laughs> so the big claim, the big bombast, is just noise, right? So be a little skeptical when AI people come and they give you all the bombast and the rhetoric and how dangerous this thing is because often it's just noise, okay? Now, now the last five minutes, just a lot of pictures, right? Because I don't have any answers. We always hear about these as the AI threats. Right? There's going to be long, the jobs will be lost. It's true, jobs will be lost, but we're going to have to do something. That's a social problem, not a technical problem. Or the face recognition, you know, people in China being monitored where they are and things. It's true, it's happening. We have to figure out how to do this. People are going to wear stuff. I don't know. People will wear masks that look realistic. I don't know what people will figure it out. No? This, this business about, about starting Luddite reactions and things like that, it's all going to happen, but, and it's a social problem. We have to, as AI people, actually work to make sure that when these things do come about, they come about in a properly informed and well-structured way, as opposed to just a lot of bombast with a lot of mistakes and things. That's the best we can do. What is happening today, as a real step, is that jobs are being lost. Here are places where real jobs are being lost today. And I don't know what we can do about that. You can't stop progress. You can't stop automation. Often the automation things are better than people. It's better to put robots picking things than to employ Mexicans or, or, or Malaysians or something in inhuman conditions to work at that speed. It just is better. But then you must do something to give Mexicans and, and Malaysians and whatever their, their, their lives, right? Otherwise you get the Trump phenomenon where people have no jobs, they're angry and they vote for someone like Trump. You cannot countenance that, right? 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 We have to be very careful what's happening. No? The jobs that I can think of that are not amenable to AI, and I can't think of it, the warmth of a nurse, the magic or charisma of Trump or some politician, right? That sort of thing. There are not many of them. Every job has a lot of routine stuff where AI can help. It's going to happen. So we better be ready for it. So the best way I can think of being ready for it is telling our students and our our, our population, how to fix, how to make sure that when the AI is doing something, it's doing what's advertised to do and we have tested it properly. Okay? So we have to be sure that we don't inadvertently overclaim and make all kinds of Luddite reactions happen when they shouldn't happen. And we have to make sure that when there's a real danger, we alert everybody to the real danger so that we can develop things to block that. Right? So here at Melbourne Connect, we are aware of this problem, actually very aware of this problem. And <clears throat> we have both in the, in the research side and in the industry side, people looking at this in different ways from their different perspectives. Right, so Melbourne Connect, one slide, the, the point is to take the ideas and the needs of companies, of industry, and go look at the research, what the potential are, and bridge that gap, close the chasm, and carry new ideas out from research land into application land, real world land, and let it run and make, make society better. But we have to be careful in that transition that we do the ethically responsible, socially responsible AI activity, right? So there are various techniques that I don't have time to go into for how you can actually check your AI you can go do things, like I said, these edge cases. Go, go give it funny addition. Go give it strange texts to read. Go
go look at that. There are ways you can say, explain yourself, AI machine. Tell me why you did. Give me your vector and give me an explanation for why your vector looks this way. There are people working on that all the time. There are, ways, there are other ways of, of designing the software and in, in embedding it in simulation environments so that it actually is tested before it's gone out. And we don't, in AI land, do enough of that. So that's something we as a society must mandate. We must mandate. In Melbourne Connect, we have a lot of, of people aware of this problem from the digital health um, centre upstairs there, right? People who are showing how you actually embed your technology inside human-like spaces, and you can watch what happens. You can study when people make mistakes, when they have a mis misunderstanding, or so, when, they, when they do things wrongly. There is the Centre for AI Ethics upstairs, where people look at this and say, what are the ethical implications of this AI? And why are you employing this AI? Maybe you shouldn't even employ this AI. Why should we be working with defence industries or not working with defence industries? What are the arguments for and against? When is AI dangerous and when is AI good? It's a nuanced situation. There's no single right answer. It's a very difficult thing that we have to keep working on, all of us, together, right? If you're an AI researcher, you sit there with the responsibility to do your work properly. If you're not an AI res uh, researcher, you sit there with the responsibility of putting the finger on the AI researcher and saying, do your work properly. Did you test your thing? Are there ethical implications? Tell me. I can tell you in all our conference papers now in my field, we have to write the ethical impact statement in every paper. And it's difficult for some of these students. They come from countries where there's no concern about ethics. Suddenly, they have to learn a lot of things about ethical behavior, right? It's a damn good thing, too, right? The more we put this into research right at the ground floor, the better we are for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ed, that was, uh, you really took us on a fabulous journey there. And uh, I know I feel a lot more um, knowledgeable in terms of grappling with um, understanding when people talk about AI and the threats and opportunities. And I also think we can challenge ourselves to think about what's the future we want to create, not just the one that's coming up ahead of us. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Steve Morris, Group Owner, Data Intelligence Business at Telstra. Mr. Morris works with data engineers, data scientists and partner organisations in deploying AI across the full range of Telstra challenges and opportunities. He is leading Telstra's efforts to have 100% of key business processes enhanced by using AI by financial year 2025. Please welcome Steve Morris. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Professor Hovey, for a truly inspiring presentation. It's great to see um, minds like yours at work. There's a number of things that you said that I just would quickly um, respond to. Firstly, you made the point about uh, straightforward versus magical AI. Uh, and I like the term magical because it conjures up that, um, that mystery. Um, I think every software vendor in Australia sells their software with a degree of AI mystery, a, a black magic, a, a secret source. Um, and I guess from an industry perspective, we categorise our AI probably slightly differently. We don't have a magical category in our AI register. Um, we tend to think of our AI at Telstra in terms of less about the technology or the complexity of the technology that we're using and more about the consequence. Um, so we have high, medium and low categories um, of AI running at Telstra. And let me just explain the difference between some of those categories. A model that might predict, say, someone interested in sports and KO versus someone interested in Xbox and gaming might not be considered a high risk model because the consequence of getting it wrong might be an ad displayed to that person about something they're not that interested in. The consequences are not high. The consequence for us on stopping a spam SMS message that wasn't actually spam and that someone was sending legitimately is much higher. 
So for that sort of model, and we do use AI in, in those sort of examples, um, we spend a lot more time and a lot more um, effort to curate that work. Um, so there's sort of our categories. Another example of that might be AI, which is going to a human, a Telstra staff member, for their consideration versus going directly to a customer. So we have examples of models that are making recommendations about what an agent should do or say, um, and they are given more leniency and more flexibility than those ones that are communicating directly with our customers or deciding whether to send them an iPhone 14 for fraud or legitimate customer discrimination. I guess one of the things that also really fascinates me about AI um, as a pilot, um, AI has been used in aviation for a long time. Um, you know, the phrase autopilot is common. Um, you'll find it in the dictionary. Um, it's, it's that interesting handoff between when does a human trust the machine and when does the human take over? Or if you're familiar with aviation, in some cases, the autopilot switches itself off because it's got itself into a circumstance that it doesn't fully comprehend. And it's almost that hospital hand pass back to a human, I don't understand what's going on. And that really fascinates me personally. So, so our categories are, are probably not straightforward versus magical, but we do have categories of our AI. Um, on neural networks, um, I'm interested in neural networks. We don't have a lot of neural networks running at Telstra in production. Um, one of the reasons, and if you type into your favourite search engine, your AI-powered search engine, Telstra AI, you'll land on a page um, which talks about uh, our ethical principles in regards to AI. It's the, it's the first ranking response. We actually list eight Australian AI principles that we were um, co-developed uh, and that we're part, part of. One of those is transparency, which means we need to be able to explain why the model is performing the way it is. And as you heard Professor Hovey discuss, neural networks are very difficult to explain. So there are some circumstances, some high risk circumstances that we don't presently use neural networks in, simply because we can't fully explain to our customers or ourselves why the decision was how it is. Um, some of the other principles, just for your um, interest, fairness, contestability, the ability to go to a model and say, or to have a customer go to a model and say, we'd like to understand the reason for this. And accountability, having something owned by a human is important as well. Um, also in the uh, results, if you type in Telstra AI, you will see, um, as was said in the introduction, our objective to have 100% um, of key business processes AI enabled by 2025. And that's something that I'm actively working on with some of my colleagues. Uh, finally, Professor Hovey talked about what we can and must do, that, that ethical element to the end of the presentation. Um, and where I see AI moving to, in, in large corporates at least, is it's moving out of the preserve of a few to become uh, the domain of the many. So what we're seeing is less and less uh, AI being talked about only by data scientists, and we're seeing more um, subject matter experts, more engineering experts, more end users using AI, whether they realise it or not. And in some cases, the products from our leading providers um, of AI tooling, like Microsoft, for example, are stratified for auto ML, the sort of ML machine learning that an end user uses almost without realising it, built into a desktop package, or an API that you call without realising it. Uh, a designer element, which is more drag and drop, where someone uh, of a more engineering or a data-centric um, training can use it without being a data scientist. And then finally, the notebooks and the Python that our data scientists typically use. So we're seeing a diversification and a spreading of the tooling in corporate, um, which I think is um, really helpful. Um, there's a lot of other AI that we get presented with uh, from vendors, as I mentioned, from internal staff. There's lots of opportunities for AI in corporate. Part of our challenge is to discriminate between um, those things that are really desirable, those things that are viable, 
and those things that are feasible. Um, we have a lot more ideas than we actually put into production. So having that structured mentality about when to use AI is very important for Telstra. And finally, um, the least sexy part of AI, um, but one of the most um, practical challenges that we face as a large entity is operating AI well. Um, you don't have a network and not operate it. You don't have an IT system and not operate it. You don't have AI and not operate it. You need change control, model management, logging, monitoring, data quality checks, data drift checks. These things are all very important for taking AI out of um, the research and interest uh, of academics and into the practical reality of some of uh, the major applications and, and corpor corporations. But it was a fantastic address. Thank you um, once again, Dr. Hovey. I, I really thought um, your uh, presentation was eye-opening and I uh, very much appreciate it. And now it's over to you. We would really warmly like to invite you to ask some questions. We've got incredible knowledge and great perspective here with Steve and Ed. We have some roving mics here in the, uh, here in the room with us, ready to take your questions. We're using the mics particularly so that uh, those who are joining us uh, live streaming can hear your questions. And I warmly invite you as you ask your question, if you could share with us perhaps your name and where you're from. Um, if you feel comfortable to do so, that'd be lovely too. So do I have any questions from the audience? Yes, over here, thank you very much. Hi, my name's Laura Mossman from the Centre for Wellbeing Science. I have a question about the programming of the vectors and um, just AI in general. How vulnerable is it to the diversity of the people that are programming those vectors? So I'm thinking, like, does it incorporate age diversity and cultural di diversity and Indigenous views? So that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Ed, if you could answer that question. I think that's question. a fantastic question and a very, very topical one now. As, as people started using these models, one of the first models they used, actually it was trained on a lot of text in Reddit and Twitter and things, and within about less than nine hours, it took on an extremely racist and ugly personality. It was just racist and, you know, anti-Nazi, pro-Nazi, all kinds of things like this. And the scientists, this was in Seattle, they looked and they said, well, that's the data. I'm a scientist. Thank you very much. And the world said, what the hell are you doing? Excuse the language, but you can't allow this sort of thing to go. You give everybody a bad name, plus you, you, it's, it's just irresponsible. So a big piece of text-based NLP ethics came directly from that, saying, well, how do we unbias our systems? So now you look and you sit with a conundrum as a scientist. You say, well, and there's lots of people working on this now. I have graduate students from, and, and colleagues graduate students where you say, I have my data, <clears throat> and when I look at my data, I can see there's a bias in the data. So I'm now going to build, either I must do surgery on the data to remove the biased parts, or I must do surgery on the system so that it will sort of blind itself to the biased parts. If I do either, I am messing around with the scientific integrity of my system, right? I'm not a scientist anymore. I'm now a politically informed scientist, which can go the wrong way too, right? When, when the communist masters or somebody tell me what to do, you know, etc. So now I end up in a very difficult ethical position as a researcher. Am I going to do surgery on my system or on my data to make the results socially acceptable, but at the cost of being scientifically true to the data? Or am I just going to say to hell with it, it's, it's a social problem, it's not my data problem? So every student I've met now and in all the professional organizations I know of, and I believe very much in the corporate world and so on, the, the emphasis has completely gone into we need to make these systems be socially acceptable, just like 
we as humans have to be socially accessible. Whatever my beliefs are, I can go spout all kinds of crazy stuff. It's just not acceptable, right? It doesn't matter what the science, quote unquote, says. You make a science of the art of removing bias. And so there's a whole new science going up with what they call adversarial training, where you have a system pitted against another. One neural network is doing something, the other one is saying, can I smell bias in here? Hmm? Yes, no, okay, there's a bias, I need to retrain this thing with backpropagation. If I cannot smell bias in here, you're okay, right? So you pit these systems against one another, that's one of the approaches people take. But it is a very important question, because as a scientist, you cannot predict what's going to be the next hot topic tomorrow. Indigenous issues, anti-Jewish issues, ageism, where, where do you end, right? And how do you, so you have to make a science of this question so that you can apply it as society needs you to apply it. And that's the way it's going. So it's a great question. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Thank you. First in jeopardy here, first question, <coughs> first hand out the back. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Kuzmin. I'm the founder of a um, startup called WePower AI. Uh, my question is about training data. Uh, so what's implicit in your talk is that both for straightforward AI and magical AI, uh, what's essential is the training data. The model is only as good as the data. Um, and human beings generate lots of that training data. Uh, let's take the example of uh, facial image recognition. Um, if the model is trained on only white males, it will be really bad at recognizing dark-skinned uh, subjects. Um, so the question is about the future of training data. Um, it, clearly, data has lots of value. And um, right now, in different uh, countries around the world, the attitude towards that training data is very different. Let's say in China or Russia, uh, governments uh, are very liberal in their use of, uh, of that human-generated data. They just use it for uh, training these really powerful algorithms, um, and they're getting more advanced. Whereas in Western countries, there is more uh, respect for the ownership of the uh, data, and uh, it, it, it actually poses uh, challenges for uh, developers who actually need to pay lots, uh, lots of money for, for that training data. So the question is, uh, what do you believe is the future for the asset, uh, ethics, the economics of training data? Okay, so <laughs> this, this, this ties into the previous question to some degree. And the control of the data is a very important aspect. If you have, as a researcher, all the data, you can choose what surgery to do. But if there's some data you cannot get to because of ethical and other concerns, let's say medical data, about certain individual patients' characteristics or healthcare and stuff, whereas across the ocean or somewhere they can do what they like, you end up with a disadvantage. This is very clear in the whole war, one can call it now, of misdisinformation. Before I came here, I was at DARPA. I learned a lot about what's going on in misinformation. It scared me. The West is the playing field and the experimentation ground for misinformation experiments run by certain countries. And we cannot reciprocate. We cannot, we don't have the data, we don't have the permission to do the same thing that we just don't do it, right? So you have an asymmetrical warfare, which is actually a very difficult thing to work about. Right? You want to protect yourself and your society against being manipulated by people who have much more data and all kinds of data and can split and do funny things with the data than you're allowed to do. But because of your ethical principles, you're at risk and vulnerable. How you negotiate this and how you work on this question is a very, very, very difficult challenge and we have to protect ourselves. So there is research right here in this building and other places or people who want to do research who actually say it is a bigger challenge. We have a higher standard. We have to do research that with limited data, with admittedly controls on certain things, we can still do data imputation, guessing, doing other kinds of techniques so that we can still respond and protect ourselves against these challenges and do the right thing. It's just more difficult. It'll take us longer. And we have to protect ourselves, but we have to do it. There is no choice, no question, 
right? So this is an interesting issue, another interesting issue, like you brought up, in a different part of social space. Now, I'm sure that in companies you have exactly the same problem, right? You have data that you could use but are not allowed to use or that you want to use but is questionable and stuff. You have all kinds of data control policies, no? Yeah? Uh, y yes, Telstra takes <coughs> the data of its customers very seriously. There are some classes of data that are highly restricted uh, under our classification system, an example of which would be location data derived from mobile phone networks. Um, but generally speaking, we, we redact uh, and remove sensitive data to the maximum extent possible. Sometimes we tokenize it um, or hash it as well, uh, depending on the circumstance. But I think all, all Australian corporates are very protective of um, their customers' data um, to, to the extent that I've seen. And, and certainly we don't work in, with the sort of data that you've um, referenced as with facial recognition technology or, or those sorts of things. Thank you. And very sadly, uh, I need to wrap up right there, but uh, I felt we were just, just at the tip of some even more exciting questions. Of course, you may have the opportunity to catch Steve and Ed at the end of this or to follow up. We are Melbourne Connect for a reason. If there's any further questions you'd like to hook through, uh, please reach out to us and we'd be delighted to um, follow those up for you. So this brings me to the conclusion of our evening and to thank our speakers, Professor Edward Hovey and Steve Morris, and particularly you, the audience, for joining us and for making this possible. I think what you've heard is that these are exciting times. Yes, there are some scary challenges. As you've heard, I'm really keen personally that we think about what's the future we want to create and how we engage with these technologies in the way that Ed and Steve had outlined. And how can we contribute? How can we participate uh, in this really um, emerging and important field? So good night, safe travels to wherever you're going next, and I hope to see you again back here at Melbourne Connect. And this concludes the oration for this evening.